We have to go in now, Jay said. Altia and Nave wandered from room to room for a while, staring at the monumental bronze architecture around them. There are so many similarities here to what we found at the Drifter Artifact, and on Ice Tomb, Altia said silently in his mind. This has to be a Drifter site. There is no doubt. And it must be alive, Nave said, based on that trick they did with the atmosphere. I guess so, Altia said, but everything here looks dead. A light came on in Nave's visor, a little blinking symbol in warm gold against the smoky bronze background. What's that? He started to ask, but Altia interrupted him. Something is scanning us, she said. Nave's military training came flooding back. He grabbed his block gun as he swept the space with his eyes and the flashlight beam in his offhand. There, he said. Target acquired. It's a standard Imperial drone. A pack rat. Shoot it? Altia said, half order, half question. Yeah, Nave agreed. I think so. Nave had a lot of experience with drones. With one time, he ran a team of wolfhound drones for the Imperial Terrazid Space Navy. And he was pretty sure this one wasn't being operated by a handler. Something about its movements told him it was being operated by a relatively simple behavior program. Probably with some minimal instructions and rules of engagement. Whatever was running the drone, human handler, software, or an AI, it recognized hostile intent as Nave swept his arms round to cover it. One with a light, one with a gun. The drone opened fire at pretty much the same time Nave did. The strange, intensely focused flash at the muzzle of Nave's block gun illuminated a room in a cold white light for fractions of a second, while other fractions of a second were illuminated by the drone's blaster cannon. It was a warmer, redder light, like fire. Flashes of fire and lightning came one after another as Nave and the drone exchanged fire. The drone hit Nave with three shots, every shot in its burst accurate, while well, Nave missed once, then hit, and would have hit with his third shot if the drone's blaster strike didn't send him staggering back. His armor was blackened and very slightly dented by the drone hits, while the drone was smashed to the ground by the single shot he managed to get on target in return. His armor and weapon were simply both heavier than what was mounted on the drone, and that was what combat often boiled down to. Fancy shooting, Altia said, a chiding tone to her voice. Yeah, Nave nodded. I guess it could do with spending more time on the shooting range. Yes, Altia said, nodding and relenting her eyes catching Knaves. I guess we all could. Anyway, it was just a recon drone, he said. No real threat. Except it will have reported our presence, Altia pointed out. There is that, Nave agreed. Maybe we should move on. Wait. One moment, Altia said. Before we do. That is a map. Nave looked where she was pointing, and he nodded. Could be, he agreed. It is, she hissed. I have to take a look at this, and I have to concentrate, so watch my back, okay? No problem, Nave said. As she studied the map, her back to the room, intently scrutinizing the map, Nave swept his eyes left and right through the room, gun ready to raise and fire. He wondered how close by the nearest other units were. He wondered if the recon drone even had called for backup. It depended who had written its software, but it seemed a pretty safe bet. Sooner or later, they would have company, and would probably be more than just another recon drone. That set him wondering how much longer Altia was going to be. He glanced over his shoulder, saw her finger tracing a line, pausing at some hieroglyphics, then continuing on as she committed the map to memory. He saw a hieroglyph slowly fade under her finger, then come back slightly different as if it had updated. Did you see that? he asked. Yes, she said. It appears this place isn't quite as dead as it looks. Hey, aren't you supposed to be looking the other way? Guarding my back? It took another agonizing ten minutes before Altia pronounced herself finished with the map. But they weren't disturbed again in that time. This way, she said. Where are we going? Nave asked. To the hub of whatever life is still left in this place. Okay, Nave said. That sounds like a plan. Did you happen to find a monorail or something marked on the map? No, Altia said. We walk. I was afraid of that, Nave muttered, and followed a couple of steps behind her as she moved off. 
The ambush came 20 minutes later. From the point of view of military tactics, it was crude, but effective rather than fancy. Even Knave, with his deficient training, could have created a better crossfire, and given his units better cover. They were crossing a large space, both exposed, with no obvious cover. There were two drones ahead of them, and two behind. They were a design Knave hadn't seen before. Both he and Altia had been shot numerous times before either of them realized they were being attacked. The weapons the drones were armed with were dangerous, and the whole encounter was more threatening than when they had encountered the single recon drone. Altia started firing first, but two shots from her block gun later, and both the enemy robots were still on their feet. They both still had powerful blaster rifles at their shoulder, and they were both still firing. Altia's faceplate cracked, and she was knocked to the floor, while Nave wasn't having much luck with his adversaries either. He had missed again with one of his shots, but hit with the other, sending the drone's blaster rifle spinning from its hands. Thanks to the time dilation effect gifted to him, Nave had the opportunity to watch the robot look at its blaster rifle, then look at him, trying to decide whether the best course of action was to retrieve the gun or close with him. Nave braced himself as the drone turned its head decisively from the rifle and come running. As it ran, a length of sharp metal extended from the back of its wrist. Powers, Nave cursed and fired off a couple more shots before the thing arrived. His shots were well aimed and blasted away the drone's arm, but the one that didn't have a wicked-looking blade extending from it. Then the robot was on him and stabbing. Its blade sent sparks flying in the dim light as it impacted with Nave's armor but didn't penetrate. Meanwhile, Altia rolled onto her belly, aimed at the drone she had already hit a couple of times, and fired at it again. This time, it burst apart in a cascade of limbs, components, and armor plates. Its legs and a section of torso kept their feet for a moment before toppling to the side. By then, Altia was already shooting at the other drone. It was striding fearlessly towards her, and shot after shot slammed into her armor. None of them had penetrated yet, but each one was like being kicked by some large beast of burden. Her ears were ringing, she tasted blood in her mouth, but she kept her cool and fired again at the second drone. It was a lucky shot, destroying the thing's head, which resulted in it crumbling to its knees, then curling into a ball. At last, she was able to turn and see how Nave was doing. She saw him holding one of the drones by the neck, with his block gun pressed against its chest as it was slashing at him with a blade. He pulled the trigger, sending the drone tumbling backwards, still not completely out of action, despite all the punishment it had taken. Altia targeted the other drone that was attacking Nave, standing a few meters away, rifle to its shoulder, firing whenever it got a shot at him that wasn't obstructed. Altia fired and made it flinch without any noticeable damage. She suddenly wondered if the things had some kind of shields. Or maybe they just really had tough armor. Nave shot again and, at last, his blade-wielding drone attacker was out of action, allowing him to join forces with Altia and help her shoot the last drone down. Your faceplate, Nave said, when he saw the damage that had been done when one of the drones hit her armor in the head. I think it's mostly cosmetic damage, Altia said. I'm not losing atmosphere, at least. And what about you? That psycho drone with the knife chopped you up pretty good. Yeah, Nave nodded. It was going for what would be the weak points, if this was a human spacesuit. The articulations inside the arm, places like that. Well, Altia said, it's a good thing that I designed it to flex rather than articulate then. Too right, Nave said. We emerged victorious. In an inconsequential fight against a handful of drones, Altia added. I'll be surprised if they don't have some tougher challenges hidden away down here somewhere. Then let's keep moving, Nave said. Hazek were supervising three drones, trying to get the best possible defensive position, when the call came. Marines! It was the voice of Admiral Hagon himself. We have just been joined by a buzzer swarm. We also have considerable reinforcements, all transferred to my command. Wantaro was receiving the message too, and she smiled grimly at the pride in their admiral's voice. The man had more vein than anyone she had ever met. My tactical systems are predicting our victory, but the swarm isn't here simply to do battle, the admiral continued. All they care about is the drifter ship. You were going to be knee-deep in buzzers there, in a matter of minutes. Admiral, sir, Wantaro replied. 
All we have here are a handful of engineering drones and a blaster rifle each. I doubt we can hold off more than a handful of buzzers, much less a swarm. My ships are trying to prevent the majority of buzzers from reaching you, and Captain Mandajir is sending reinforcements from among her shipboard marine teams, the Admiral told her. Do what you can. Yes, sir, both women said, and the Admiral was gone. Hazek looked from the various access doors to the giant hole in the nose of the carrier. She could see flashes of light outside as the space battle raged out there. No prizes for guessing which way the buzzers are going to be coming, she said. Right through that jagged hole, Wantra agreed. We'd better redeploy the drones again, Hazek mused. But should we position them at the edge of the hole, shooting out into space? Or leave keeping the buzzers out to the Admiral, and set up a crossfire in here, to deal with the ones that inevitably do get through? Crossfire, Wantra said. Definitely crossfire. The blaster rifles we have don't have the range to be useful for preventing approaching buzzers from entering this hangar space. The space is so huge, though, Hazek said, looking round the cavernous flight deck. Then we'd better hurry, Wantra told her, as she was already taking control of a drone and repositioning it. They both worked as best they could to set up their drones in the best possible places to shoot from, but it was a pitifully insufficient force to protect such a huge space. It wasn't long before the first buzzer came powering through the hole in the ship's nose and landed on the flight deck near the drifter ship. The thing was a monster. Even a standard buzzer with four legs and arms, biomechanical armor, and heavy weapons was fearsome. But this one was some kind of assault version. Its dome-like head with its empty eye sockets was surrounded by a ridge of armor. Its body was so large it loomed in the space like a vehicle. But the worst thing was the guns. It had a turret grafted to its back with an ion cannon mounted in it. And it had two pretty standard-looking mass drivers as well. And even a standard mass driver was much more weapon than any of them had. It immediately started interfering with their radio communications, which filled with static and the roars of what sounded like jungle creatures. By the powers, Wantara said. Three of the engineering drones were close enough to engage the monster with their blaster rifles. They opened up with the single gun they each had, popping away at the mighty beast like kids playing with toy guns. Wantra squinted, scrutinizing the buzzer for any sign that the engineering drones were damaging it. Not a scratch, Hazek said, echoing her own assessment. Then the buzzer started to return fire. The engineering drone it targeted with the ion cannon was instantly reduced to scrap. Wantra watched its icon wink out from among her available forces display. The wall around the drone was also torn up, and shrapnel was sent flying in wide arcs. The buzzer doesn't seem to care about the carrier's structural integrity, Wantra said, using a tight beam laser to talk to Hasek without her words being drowned out by static and jungle noises. I guess they don't mind if the carrier comes apart and the drifter ship is left floating in space, Hasek said. That'll just make it easier to pick up. The assault buzzer targeted the other two drones with its mass drivers. It missed one of them entirely, and the last survived a direct mass driver hit. Hazek was extremely surprised to see that. The engineering drones were robust, but they didn't have a lot of armor. And sure enough, the buzzer fired at it again and destroyed it. While the alien robot was systematically shooting all her drones, it was joined by another. that came rocketing in through the gaping gap where the bow doors had once been. It was the same configuration as the first one, with an ion cannon grafted to its back and enormously thick armor. It joined its compatriot in blasting any target it saw around the cavernous flight deck. One by one, the icons showing their drones were winking out, leaving only a handful of the fearless engineering drones still carrying on the combat. This is a joke, Hazek said, as she spotted a third buzzer, powering out of space, intent on joining the battle on the flight deck. But, just as it was almost upon them, she saw a flash. It was too quick for the human eye to register, but her tactical computer told her that the buzzer had been hit by defensive fire from the carrier's turrets. A good-sized mass driver hit tore a gouging track across the creature's back, leaving a furrow of damage, and no sign of a head or of the turret that had been grafted to the creature's back. It landed, by some instinct or muscle memory, then crumpled to the blasted and uneven deck. That carcass has two mass drivers in its claws, Wantra said. 
and it certainly doesn't need them anymore. We'll grab them the first chance we get, Hasek promised. Then she gasped as she saw her total of available combat drones start to go up. A text message appeared in her line of sight, on the inside of her visor. Transferring 20 combat drones for you to use in defending the hangar bay. They are incoming to your position now. The message was signed as coming from the captain. All right, Wantra yelped. Are you seeing this message? I am, Hazak told her. And I've got a file full of specifications. They're all a design I haven't seen much of. Called a gang crawler. Looks solid, though. Specifically designed for spaceship corridor fighting. Plenty of armor and two mass drivers each. They'll do, Wantra said, as another engineering drone was reduced to smoke-belching scrap. It was just then that the first five gang crawlers came marching out of an access corridor. Wantra immediately took control of them and split them up so they wouldn't all be taken out by a single ion cannon hit. They were ungainly looking, with a spherical body that had two mass drivers embedded within. This sphere was mounted atop two nice, robust-looking legs. They may have not been pretty, but both marines were very glad to see them. They were outclassed by the two hulking buzzers, but not by much, and they outnumbered the alien biomechanoids. Wantra felt the change in the buzzers' attitudes immediately. She saw their blank eye sockets, casting about for the first time for some cover, and she noticed their rate of fire slow as they took time to aim each shot with every weapon. The gang crawlers fearlessly strode towards the two buzzers, and the enemy at last started to suffer some significant damage. One buzzer lost a leg, but didn't fall. The armor of the other was cratered, though it held. This changes everything, Wantra said, as she concentrated on directing the newly arrived drones to cover, while keeping up a hail of fire at the buzzers. If you think that's good, Hazak said, tapping her on the shoulder. You're going to love this. Wantra was surprised for a moment as Hazak handed her a huge mass driver. Then she realized that her friend must have retrieved it from the downed buzzer during the confusion while the new drones were arriving. Thanks, Wantra simply said as her attention went back to the drones she was directing. Hazak wasn't left at a loose end for long as four more drones arrived and she took control of them. The exchange of fire was becoming intense in the flight bay as another buzzer joined them, and another. They'd had the upper hand for a while, but the combat was starting to even out again. And while all this was going on, buzzers and drones blasting at each other, another shape came gliding into the bay. Hazak and Wantra at first assumed it was another buzzer come to join them, or perhaps even an assault ship full of them. But the way the buzzers moved away from it, and stared at it, told them this was wrong. It was a human ship, but a civilian design. The Sun Chaser, Wantra said, confused as she called up the ship's details from the local information web. It belongs to a civilian advisor to Hagon's fleet, a bounty hunter called Kerr. What's it doing here? Hazak asked. And then, they both noticed a docking bay opening in the flank of the alien spaceship that was lying there in the middle of the space, dwarfing the grim combat that was going on round it. The Drifter ship. He's found a way in, Wantra groaned. If that even is, Kerr. Whoever it is, Hazak said, there is no way we can allow this. Open fire. Prevent the Sun Chaser from being taken aboard. Wantra didn't have to be asked twice. She lifted her mass driver, her drones doing the same thing, and, ignoring the buzzers, she started to rake the Sun Chaser with fire. Hazak and her drones did the same thing. It was a withering storm of mass driver rods and ion bolts. The ship's shields weren't much use at such close range, and so the Sun Chaser's armor started to crater and disintegrate. Communication masts and dishes were blasted from the ship to come tumbling to the deck below, and its maneuvering thrusters were also badly damaged. It started to slip sideways, unable to perfectly maintain its position as it approached the now gaping drifter ship bay door. It slammed into the side of the bay with its nose, and the nose armor crumpled. It was a resounding clang that echoed through the chamber, for a second even drowning out the sound of the guns. Inside, Jinty was thrown from her chair and sent skidding. Jake clung onto his console and kept fighting to power the spaceship into the open bay. The marines and buzzers are all firing at us, he said. But we're inside a spaceship, Jinty complained. We should be safe. We're not there yet, Jay said, and we're losing the maneuvering thrusters. The ship's slipping back. 
It's going to miss the bay door and slam into the side of the drifter ship. Not if I can help it, Jinty said, as she ripped off a hatch from the co-pilot's console and started modulating the gravitic drives. That's crazy, Jay told her. I know what I'm doing, she said, and the ship did indeed lurch forward and topple into the docking bay. The door slammed closed behind them, and suddenly the noise of incoming fire stopped. Altia's mouth tightened as she looked at the walls around her. There is some life in this place, she said, though a vanishingly small amount. So this whole place is alive, huh? Nave said, looking around suspiciously. No, Altia said, choosing her words carefully. Not the whole place. The energy source is localized, and I'm almost certain I can follow it back to its origin point. That's where we need to be, Nave said, nodding. The origin point. The heart. They walked through the deserted and darkened halls of the alien structure, and even Nave could see the architecture coming to life around them. Glowing hexagons appeared within the walls, and a hum could now be made out, right at the edge of hearing. They entered a large corridor and saw two hulking drones at the end. They were similar to the humanoid drones they had just defeated, but heavier, more muscular. They both had a mass driver in each hand, and started firing as soon as they had a clear shot. Nave was hit in the chest and sent staggering, while Altia ducked to one knee and returned fire. It took Nave a few seconds to recover himself enough to drop to the floor beside her and start shooting. The drones didn't see cover as they had. They just stood there, in the corridor, firing. My arm's cold, Nave heard Altia's voice in his mind. I think I'm hit. Powers, Nave cursed as he was hit too. He could feel the armor being peeled away in sheets. He knew it was ablating, just as it was intended to do, to prevent the rods projected by the mass drivers from penetrating. But it was a bad feeling. A feeling he knew couldn't go on indefinitely. Ugh, he grunted as a chunk of his shoulder armor came away and bounced on the corridor floor a couple of times before coming to rest. Then the enemy drone on the left ripped in the middle, accompanied by the sound of a muffled explosion. It fell to its knees, then to its face, and dark smoke started to billow from it. Got you, got you, got you, Altia yelled as she hit the other drone three times center mass and tore it apart. It spiraled to the ground, spraying debris in a tight circle as it went down. The corridor was suddenly silent, and Altia and Nave climbed to their feet. Nave's armor was covered in craters, and some viscous black liquid was leaking from the helmet ring near his severely damaged shoulder. Altia's armor seemed to be in better condition, but she had viscous liquid smeared across it as well. In her case, the liquid was red, and it was smeared across her left arm. That's where I felt the cold, she muttered, trying to flex the arm, then giving up with a wince. For blood to get on the outside, Nave said, your armor must have been penetrated. I'm guessing it wasn't by a mass driver rod, though. Oh? Why? Altia asked. It would have torn your arm clean off, and the hydrostatic shock would have killed you, Nave said. I guess it was just shrapnel then, Altia said, her voice weak. Yeah, Nave nodded. Then notice how faint her voice was. Are you okay in there? Has the bleeding stopped? I'm fine, she told him. And the point of origin should be right through here. They walked along the corridor and kicked their way through the remains of the two drones thrown around the far end. There was a hexagonal doorway, and it was closed. How long will it take you to get that open, Nave asked. Minutes, at most, Altier replied. He heard her groaning and grunting at the pain from her wounded arm, but, true to her word, the door slid to the side in just a few minutes. On the other side was a huge space, a tall shaft like an atrium. The floor of the atrium was some kind of liquid. The walls were vertiginous cliffs of bronze, and the roof was of obviously recent human construction. Just like the Drifter world, Altia said. This shaft is a deep scar cut into the flesh of this place and we humans have provided the ugly scab tissue to seal it shut. There was just as little light in the enormous space as there had been anywhere else as they wandered through the complex, and that was the only reason it took them so long to notice the creature. It was humanoid, but had huge wings protruding from its back, and its skin was slate gray. Its face was long and blank, with ridges of horn projecting from the sides. What is that? Nave asked. Another figure appeared from behind the winged monster. This one was average height for a human, or maybe a bit shorter, so the winged monster 
slumped as it was, towered above it. This is a drifter, the figure said. The voice was mechanical and distorted, but it was recognizably male. The man's body was just as distorted and just as mechanical as his voice, but it was still recognizably human. Is it alive? Altia asked, her scientific curiosity forcing her to ask that question before a hundred more pertinent ones, such as who the man was and what he was doing here. That's a difficult question to answer, the man said. Certainly not in the sense we would use the word, but I hesitate to pronounce it dead. There is certainly much potential left in it. You have to be one of the goons who have been shooting at us, Nave said, taking a step forward and raising his gun. Don't shoot, the twisted-looking man said, instinctively raising his arms. The man also took a step back, inadvertently entering a pool of light and allowing them their first good look at him. Nave saw that he had numerous systems embedded below his skin, which looked like it had been slid open and sealed back up numerous times, leaving livid scars. He also had pipes and cables emerging from his spine and the back of his head that led down into the liquid they were all standing in. It was impossible to see where they snaked away to, or what they were connected to. Why shouldn't I shoot? Nave asked. It seems to me that would simplify things enormously. I would prefer if there weren't any shooting in my inner sanctum, the man said. It's the only reason I haven't had the numerous drones at the periphery of the sacred space simply kill you. As you say, it would simplify things, but it also risks damaging things that have taken a long time to create. Nave looked around the bottom edges of the cliffs of metal that formed the chasm, and he saw more of the hulking drones hidden in the shadows. Please, Nave, Altia said, holding out an imploring hand. No shooting. It was then that Jay contacted them. Nave and Altia connected with him, as Nave very slowly lowered his block gun. People, came Jay's voice. You still alive? Both of us, Altia replied. You and Jinty? We're both on board Galaxy Dog. Shook up, but we're not injured. Altia winced at the name, but didn't interrupt. We are starting up and heading for your position now, Jay told them. You're pretty deep within the gas giant, though, so I'm not sure how we're actually going to get to you. Any ideas? Not sure, Altia said. Get yourselves here as quickly as you can. My feeling is, we might need a short notice evacuation. With you soon, Jay said. Hold on. So, Nave said, jerking a thumb at the twisted old man. Are you saying this guy's okay? Because my first impressions are that he has a drifter as a captive, and he's doing freaky experiments on it. Oh, so, I bet it was him who launched those hybrid ships at us. No, Altia shook her head, making her armor helmet swiftly traverse left and right. He is not okay. This is doing research on a drifter facility without sanction by the science ministry. The science ministry, the old man interrupted. They're the real criminals. You, Altia. You worked under Shivia. You must know she is absolutely evil. Hey, he knows you, Nave said. And I know you too, Nave, the man continued. If only by reputation. Allow me to introduce myself. Actually, don't, Nave said. Knowing your name would just make it more difficult for me to strangle you. Nave started to stride purposely towards the old man. He was utterly convincing and Altia was glad she shared a telepathic link with him at that moment because it allowed her to be absolutely sure he wouldn't be able to go through with it. He was no cold-blooded killer. The man, of course, was not part of the telepathic loop set up between Altia and Nave by their alien armor suits. He couldn't know if Nave was serious or not and he took another involuntary step back. Wait, the old man said. Whatever you think of me, whatever you think of this, he gestured to the slumped alien titan. You need me in your battle against the emperor. Fighting together, we can usurp the throne in under a year. Haven't you been watching our propaganda, Nave said? With us, it's not about the usurping. We want to bring change. Then you're fools, the old man muttered, almost to himself. Nave had almost reached his intended victim now, and he raised his hands to neck height. Prepare yourself for a strangling, old man, he said. Stop, Nave, Altia said. That pantomime isn't getting us anywhere. What is your name, old man? Old man? The tortured figure's voice was indignant as it replied. I am Mortis, Dr. Mortis. You, Altia, must be familiar with my work. Altia gasped, making Nave turn to look at her. This all makes sense now, she said. 
but your work was proven wrong. No, Mortis snapped. My work here proves I was right. All the years Shivia has spent in discrediting me and ignoring my contributions were a waste of time, resources, and opportunity. When I retake control of the science ministry, only then will our study of the drifters really begin in earnest. What was wrong about his ideas, Nave asked Altia. Ha! Huh, Mortis snorted. Tell him. Tell your young Myrmidon. What was so wrong about my ideas? He thought the drifters practiced sacrificial rituals, Altia said. He thought they powered their technology on blood and psychic energy. And look, Mordis gloated. From the blood and psyche of just one drifter, I can power an appreciable percentage of this whole complex. I can build my hybrid ships, and I will usurp the Emperor and make Shivia beg my forgiveness. There was a pause as Altia let his words sink in. Well, that was a little unhinged. I thought he was going to do the full maniacal laugh, Nave transmitted to Altia. He doesn't seem entirely stable, does he? She agreed. What he's doing here is an abomination. We have to stop it. We have to save this creature. The drifter? Nave interrupted. I'm not convinced it actually is a drifter, Altia said. It's more likely a member of a client species. I would give a lot to be able to talk to it. Okay, so we'll blow up this base and rescue the alien, Nave said. We have our mission objectives. Now all we need is a plan. Right, Altia agreed. And I can't just shoot the guy? Nave asked. No. Altia looked round and gestured at the circumference of the space, where there were even more drones than before. I don't think we're going to be able to shoot our way to a solution here. Mortis, of course, couldn't hear the exchange between them, but he saw Altia gesturing at the surrounding drones. I see Shivia has poisoned your mind against my research, he said. And that's a shame. I would dearly have liked to get your insights on some of the things I'm doing here. But that doesn't prevent a purely political alliance. What has happened today, what is still happening, has shifted the balance of power. You have to see that. You have to join me. Chapter 23 Jay was alone on the bridge, having left Jinty in the docking bay with the Sun Chaser. He, Altia, and Nave had long ago decided that most of the drifter ship would remain off-limits to anyone except them. The ship was just too valuable an asset to let anyone go wandering around in. But her hologram was there. She was standing next to the hologram pit, from where she had a good view of him and what he was doing, along with the tactical holograms and the main view screen. It's all incredible, she said, staring around at the alien bridge. It is, Jay said, but the longer we wait around the further the carrier takes us from the gas giant. We have to go now. Yeah, Genji nodded. I know. But remember when we were bringing the Sun Chaser on board? How those marines and buzzers on the flight deck stopped shooting at each other and joined forces to try and destroy us? I remember, Jay said. The exact same thing is going to happen when we exit this carrier, Genji told him. Just so you know. I know, Jay said. But he didn't speak again. He was going to have to pilot the ship on his own. He would need to operate the weapons, shields, and drives without any aid from Altia or Nave. The large heat sink fans at the base of his skull started whirring as he brought the maximum he could of mental faculties to bear. His mind filled with the Galaxy Dog's battle interface. It was a truncated version of the controls that would be available to a drifter pilot, but not too truncated. There was very little functionality that wasn't available to him. He felt a little jolt of pride at how completely his mind could accommodate the interface. He felt the spaceship's shields become his skin. He felt the spaceship's armor and systems become his body. He saw the carrier's flight deck around him, through the spaceship sensors. All the Galaxy Dog's powerful systems were at his command, to be deployed with a thought. To battle, he muttered. Hazek was in hand-to-hand -hand combat with one of the buzzers, a very uncomfortable place to be. The damn thing seemed to be made of arms, and it had a wicked blade that had cut gashes across her armor. She had a laser-sharp combat knife in her hand, and she was making progress, hacking away at its limbs, blinding it, or at least so she hoped, with a slice across its creepy visual sensor pits. But she had a sick feeling that, through sheer size and number of limbs, the buzzer was going to win this combat. And then it was distracted. 
aware of something behind it she couldn't see. It craned its head, trying to see with its damaged eyes, and that exposed its neck to Hazak's dagger. Yes, she hissed, as she administered a surgical strike to an armored data cable, then a fluids hose, then a bundle of muscle and armor wrapped around a pneumatic piston. She could hear the thing in front of her screaming now. The buzz that always accompanied them had intensified. She felt it transmitted to the blade she was using, then through the sensors of her armor to her muscles and bones. It set her teeth on edge, and her radio was filled with a keening note of distress. She didn't let any of that distract her. She just concentrated on finishing the butchering of the beast. Now she had the armored gauntlet of her power suit in the wound she had created with the knife. She upped the power to her shoulder and arm actuators and ripped the monster's head clean off. She kicked the now headless body away as it fell before her. Then she gathered up a mass driver from a puddle of alien vital fluids on the deck. The buzzers had such a huge advantage in hand-to-hand -hand combat that she couldn't just allow one to get that close again. She had to keep them away with mass driver fire. With the gun in her hands and ready to fire, at last she looked up, and she saw what had distracted the buzzer. The drifter ship had lifted off. It was only three or four feet clear off the deck, but it was already moving backwards, extracting itself from the carrier. By the powers, she muttered a curse. It was a wonderful sight, a smooth and swift maneuver executed by a graceful ship. The buzzers were watching too, ignoring her, Wantra, and their drones now. They were crouched in secure firing positions, all firing at the escaping spaceship's engines with the ion cannon grafted to their backs. Hazak snorted in derision. She couldn't see what damage they were going to do with those pea shooters against the drifter ship. Let's even the odds in here, she heard Wantra say over the comms. Let's, she replied. I never had any problem shooting anyone in the back, especially not a buzzer. They both started firing at the buzzers, while the monsters were engaging the spaceship. Their drones echoed their targeting, and joined them in firing on the distracted buzzers. One buzzer after another was targeted and destroyed. But the alien machines didn't react. They kept firing at the retreating drifter ship. A situation that had been becoming hopeless because they were so outnumbered was rapidly becoming manageable again, with each buzzer that fell, or at least survivable. Hazak, Wantra. It was Admiral Hagon's voice. Join the buzzers in firing on the drifter ship engines. Hazak hesitated, unsure whether it was a trick. If the buzzer's iron cannon were being shrugged off by the shields, what use was there in her firing at it with her squad support mass driver? She actually looked at the gun in her hands. A buzzer mass driver, like the one she was holding, was a little heavier than a human one. That was true. Had more of a kick. But even so, there was absolutely no chance it was going to penetrate spaceship armor. And there were plenty of buzzers right in front of her that it did have a gratifyingly destructive effect on. Hazak, Wantara, Hagan's voice again. This is a direct order. Open fire now. Both Marines targeted the engines their drones joining them, and started firing. As it cursed with every squeeze of the trigger. It was a stupid order. She had felt a grudging respect for Hagon increasing over recent weeks, but it was all gone now. A hologram of Hagon was alongside Captain Mandajir on the bridge of the carrier, urging her to do what she could to detain the drifter ship as long as possible. Tractor beams, she ordered. Yes, Hagon's hologram hissed. Excellent idea. It's too big, the tactical officer said, and its engines are too powerful. Tractor beams, the captain growled. She and Hagon watched on the main viewer as the drifter ship started to back out of the carrier's flight deck. She could see all her forward tractor beam projectors glowing white as they attempted to use pure gravitic force to prevent the drifter ship's escape. The carrier was by far the largest ship, and it was outfitted with powerful tractor beams. So if it was simply a question of mass the drifter ship would never be able to escape. But that was reckoning without its engines. Its massive engines were firing, and nothing could stop it leaving. All they could do was slow it down. Hagon watched as turrets emerged from the drifter ship's nose and fired on the tractor beam projectors. One after another, they were destroyed in bright flashes of energy, dumped into them by the drifter ship's weapons. It was too much for the carrier's tortured superstructure, which started to come apart. The carrier was slowly ripped in two, a mangled front half, 
and a somewhat more intact rear. All power failed a few seconds later, and the drifter ship was free. It turned and powered towards the gas giant, surrounded for a moment by a lull in fighting as the battling forces decided how to react to what had just happened. On his flagship, Hagon was opening his mouth to give an order when he saw the Imperial Seal appear in the bridge hologram pit. Not now, not now, he muttered as a hologram of the Emperor himself appeared. He smiled grimly as he realized the Emperor's hologram was accompanied by Shivia. She noticed and smiled back, but the Emperor just immediately started yelling. What is happening, Admiral? he yelled. My prize is being stolen out from between my fingers. Treachery, Hagon said. Our forces were fired on by Tarvis, just as we were attaching the capture craft to the drifter ship. Since then, this battle has been chaos. Imperial fighting Imperial. And the buzzers trying to snatch away the prize while we destroy each other. Chaos. Tarvis will pay for what he has done today, the Emperor vowed. But can you recapture the drifter ship? I suggest we forget that objective for now. We should concentrate on degrading Tarvis as much as possible while he fights the buzzers for the drifter ship. Shivya reluctantly nodded. It was now the most sensible strategy. The Emperor considered a moment longer, then shook his head. No, he said. We must have that ship. It's important can't be overestimated. I think it can, Hagon said, interrupting the Emperor. It's not worth two entire battle grass silence, Shivya screamed, appalled that Hagon would dare gainsay the Emperor. Hagon went pale, realizing what he had done, and the Emperor's mouth tightened. He was acutely aware this was happening in front of a bridge full of people. You have your orders, Admiral, he said, and the Emperor's hologram faded. Hagon looked imploringly at Shivya, who just shook her head dismissively in return. Never interrupt the Emperor, she groaned. Now grow up, get a grip, and bring me back that drifter ship. Her hologram faded too, leaving Hagon alone on his bridge with his command team. Do we have any spaceship left in this fleet with a flight deck big enough to take the drifter ship? Hagon asked. Yes, Admiral, his fleet officer told him. We have the fastness. It has a flight deck that could do the job, with some modification. Modify it as you move into position. Now, let's knock out their engines. But, his tactical officer said, if we, the traitor, and the buzzers are all targeting the engines, we are just as likely to simply blow it out of space as we are to disable it. You heard the Emperor, Hagan said with a shrug. Now fire. The commander of the buzzer swarm didn't hesitate for a second. As soon as he saw the drifter ship escape the humans, all his fleet started turning as one, the smaller units more quickly, and the larger units more slowly. All his units were dedicated to chasing the drifter ship. Capturing that small ancient alien ship was the reason his swarm had been spawned, and he had no interest in the relative strength or weakness of human forces, or what factions they happened to be dividing themselves into at that moment. He would fire on them if need be, but otherwise intended to leave them alone. All he cared about was the drifter ship. Mordis was joined in his lair by a hologram of Admiral Tarvis. Tarvis opened his mouth to speak then noticed the combat drones in the shadows, then the two figures in strange bronze power armor. What the? he gasped. What's going on here, Mortis? Who are those two people? They are burglars, nothing more, Mortis said. Their names are Nave and Altia. The leaders of the rebellion, Tarvis said, confused. How did they penetrate your sanctum? That's impossible. Yes, it is, Mortis said, giving his two visitors a calculating look. It certainly is. So, what did you want, Tarvis? The entire Imperial fleet has opened fire on the drifter ship, and so has the buzzer swarm. Our ships are the only ones not firing at it right now. I'm afraid it will just be blasted to pieces. Alti and Nave exchanged a glance. Are you getting this? Nave silently asked Jay, up on the galaxy dog. I am, the robot's words came back. Though, I don't need a traitor admiral to tell me I'm under fire from an entire fleet and a whole swarm. The drifter ship is strong, but it is not indestructible, Mortis said. I think it is a wise course not to join in bombarding it. I want to engage the spider-like spaceships the buzzer swarm is holding in reserve to take away the drifter ship, 
should they manage to disable it without blowing it to smithereens. Excellent idea, Mortis nodded. But for that, Tarvis said, I need more of your hybrid ships. Why did you send up so few before closing the vortex? I need more. You will have to be grateful for what you have been given, Mortis snapped, and he dismissed the Admiral's hologram. Nay felt Altius' thoughts in his mind. That's interesting, Altia said. Nave, I have to do some meditating. Meditating? Nave was shocked. It was hardly the time. Yes, she said in his mind. Trust me, it's important. I'll give you control of my suit while I go under. Just move me about like a drone. Can you take care of things here? Sure, Nave said, instinctively drawing his gun. Through their telepathic connection, he felt Altia close her eyes, and then he felt her mind slip away to somewhere else, leaving him alone with the alien beast and its crazy old captor. Hey, Mortis yelped, his eyes on the gun Nave had just drawn. I thought we agreed there would be no shooting here. The twisted old man gestured round the periphery of the room. Besides, if it does come to a shootout, you will assuredly come off worst. Don't bet on it, Nave said, then started improvising to give Altia the time she needed to do whatever it was she was doing. And, it would be a good idea to get on our good side. The Rebellion will soon be top dog, out there, in space. I'm quite a big deal in the operation and I won't forget this little freak show down here. Your forces are nothing compared to mine, Mortis spat, rising to the bait. But, Nave pointed out, his voice mock-friendly. It sounds like your fleet is being chewed up by the Emperor and the Buzzer Swarm. Huh, <laughs> Mortis grunted. Whatever happens in this battle, your drifter ship will be either destroyed by the clumsy idiots fighting for the Emperor or the Buzzers, or it will be captured by me. The man's words sounded quite convincing to Nave, and he didn't really know how to respond. Especially when the man started cackling maniacally to himself. Me. <laughs> me. <laughs> Altia was swimming through the subterranean sea, towards a disfigured and ruined tower. As she swam closer, she saw that there was a winged creature chained to one of the towers, with cables and conducts dug into its flesh. Up above, far above, on one of the upper levels of the tower, she saw a figure. Impossible to make out at this distance. Altia swam right up to the creature bound at the base of the column, and there was now no doubt in her mind that it was the same one she had just seen slumped on the floor in the waking world. She touched its skin, and the creature convulsed, massive muscles like slabs of stone straining against the chains that bound it. The force of the creature's movement caused a wave that pushed Alti away and sucked her down below the surface of the dark subterranean ocean. Nave thought he saw the slumped creature move, very slightly. At first, he wasn't sure if he'd seen anything at all, he was only certain when he saw Mortis's reaction. The hideous old man turned to stare at the creature, a shriek of frustration escaping his desiccated lips. Nave saw machines below the man's skin working faster, pumping and pulsing. Something wrong with the patient? Nave asked. Mortis ignored him, moving closer to his monster and attaching devices to the creature's skin to join the ones that were already there. The old man was paying absolutely no attention to Nave at all which gave him a chance to think. He looked to his left and his right, and he counted exactly how many drones he could see. There were exactly twenty-three. These are the only drones we have, aren't they, old man? Nave whispered. If you had more, they'd be here. I guess you never thought anyone would ever be able to penetrate your sanctum. He found it comforting that there wasn't an army of drones, just this handful. He could also feel his armor recovering from the damage it had taken earlier. It had an auto-repair function more powerful than any that human power armor had. Still, 23 was a lot of drones. If there had only been 5, or even 10, he would have been more confident. But how was he supposed to take out 23 drones? Altia powered her way back to the surface of the inky ocean with mighty strokes of her arms and kicks of her feet. She broke the surface and saw more chains being lowered onto the creature. Some wrapped themselves around it, while others attached themselves directly to the creature's skin, fusing with the flesh there and causing nasty-looking burns. 
How can I help you? Altia screamed, as the creature thrashed around and she was buffeted by wave after wave. She screamed her offer of help in Terezine, and in all the dialects of the languages of the drifters that she had been decrypting. But the creature didn't seem to hear her. It was useless. There was no way she could see or think of to communicate with it. By the powers, she cursed, and she punched the water. She still didn't understand the environment she was in. It was, she guessed, some kind of virtual or augmented reality. But what was its purpose? How could she interact with it and manipulate it, the way Morgus was doing? She was sure it was him atop the tower, and he seemed to have some control over the environment. She looked at the bound titan in front of her again, steeled her nerve, and again swam to it. She touched its skin again, but this time she did more than touch. She grabbed hold of one of the intersections between the chains and creature's flesh, where the metal of the chain and the skin and muscle of the creature were fused. She felt energy flows within the metal and complexity hidden within its simple seeming form, and she smiled. She was starting to understand. There was a loud detonation, like a gunshot, and smoke started to pour out of one of the machines attached to the creature. Nave ducked instinctively, and Mortis, who was much closer, was thrown backwards. He fell on his ass in the water, and sat there, gazing in confusion at his captive. Why is it fighting me? he almost whimpered. Another detonation, more smoke, and the slumped creature shifted a little. Nave saw one of its mighty shoulders twitch. This has gone far enough, Mortis muttered, and the drone started shooting. Nave lost sight of the twisted old man, and he was forced to turn his attention to fighting an overwhelming number of drones. He returned fire with his block gun, and Altia's armor suit, following his instructions like a drone, did the same. He also ran at the nearest drone, trying to get as close as possible to it as quickly as possible. As he did that, Altia's armor was doing exactly the same thing. It picked out a drone and charged it. With virtually a room full of hostile drones firing at him, Nave was pretty sure a few of their shots would hit the drone he had chosen to run at, and he wasn't disappointed. He only had to fire at it once to disable it, on top of the other damage it took from its comrade shooting at Nave, missing and hitting it instead. Altia's armor, under his direction, also destroyed a drone, but there was still left over twenty. Nave felt shot after shot hitting his armor, tearing at it and chewing it up. He wouldn't be able to take more than another few seconds of such punishment. He was sure. Jay felt close to despair. The planet he was diving towards was so close, relatively, but so far away. So many spaceships were chasing him, firing at him so much, that he had a very bad feeling about his chances of survival. But he had to survive, for his sake, for Jinty's sake, because she would share whatever fate befell him, and he also owed it to Altia and Nave, who, without him, would be stuck forever on the planet. He had to come up with some clever maneuver that would take him at least to the cloud tops of the gas giant. His tactical computers were telling him that the buzzers and Imperials were fighting on each other just as much as they were trying to disable the drifter ship. They were such ancient and implacable enemies that it was only to be expected. But there had to be a way to turn that to his advantage. He needed them to spend more time fighting each other and less time shooting at his engines. As he weaved his way forward toward the gas giant and the relative sanctuary of its atmosphere, instead of staying equidistant between the various ships, he moved closer to the Imperials. The buzzers reacted instantly. It must have seemed to them that the drifter ship had decided they preferred to give up to the Imperials without a fight. They immediately started bombarding the Imperial ships all the harder and the Imperials reacted in kind. The amount of fire Galaxy Dog was taking slackened, just a bit. We might make it after all, Jay muttered. Chapter 24 Otia woke up to find herself staring at a drone that was firing at her, and her armor told her it was hitting her. It wasn't the only one. Several drones were firing at her, and her armor, still under Nave's control, was firing back. I leave you in charge for five minutes, Altia groaned. Nave almost yelped for joy at the sound of her voice. 
He felt his armor hit by round after round, and he also felt it fail. He instantly knew it was bad, even though he didn't know quite what had happened. A mass drive around, luckily on a trajectory, that just barely caught a glancing blow to his side, defeated his shields and his armor, and tore a hole in his power suit. He felt his skin burning as energy was dumped into it by the passing mass driver rod, but he also felt the frigid atmosphere come in and chill the area of torso that wasn't singed or burning. As if that wasn't enough, his suit provided a helpful synopsis of the damage it had sustained. The information appeared right in front of his eyes in the heads-up display inside his armor visor. It was a simple diagram of a human, with a huge area of its side suddenly going red, and then black. Well, that doesn't look good, he muttered. Nave, Altia screamed, feeling the terrible damage he had taken through their mental connection. I'm okay, Nave said, aiming for reassuring, but there was a waver in his voice that betrayed just how badly he had been hit. You're not, Altia hissed. Make like a spaceship and rotate your damaged armor away from incoming fire. It was good advice, but the only problem was, fire was incoming from every direction. He paused a second to try and work out what direction was sending the most blaster bolts and mass driver rods his way, so he could at least twist his damaged torso armor away from that point of the compass. And that was when he noticed. They were taking a lot less fire than just moments before, but he didn't know why. He was confused, which wasn't helped by the blood loss he was suffering. A lot of the wound had cauterized, but there was still a fair amount of blood seeping out of it. It took him a long time to realize the winged monster had awoken and climbed to its feet. It was attracting a lot of fire that had been coming his and Altia's way before, and then he saw it raise a scaly, muscular leg and stomp down on one of the drones, destroying it utterly. Yeehaw, Nave yelled suddenly feeling a glimmer of hope that they might make it out of the crazy situation they'd gotten themselves into. I can see why Mortis decided to duck out. That thing's on our side, right, Altia? I think so, she said. I'm not sure. Good enough, Nave said. He forced himself to concentrate. He brought up his block gun and started returning fire at the drones that were still targeting him. He destroyed one and tore the arm off another the impact spinning it round. He saw Altia, in his peripheral vision, still firing, slowly reducing the number of drones standing against them, and the monster stamped again. This time, the drone almost managed to dodge, after having watched what happened to its comrade. It had attempted to come up with an evasive maneuver to use against being stomped, and it wasn't half bad. The winged creature only managed to catch the drone a glancing blow with its foot, but that was still enough to break the mechanoid's back and silence its guns. It's not an enormously high-tech attack, considering this thing might be a drifter, Nave muttered. I don't think it has a gun, Altia said. Or armor. So I guess it's improvising. Nave watched as mass driver rods cratered the beast's skin, and blaster bolts tore holes in the membranes of its wings. It stomped again, sending a drone that was a little too slow to dodge out of the way skidding across the room, badly crumpled up, but not destroyed. Nay fired at it as it skidded by, finishing it off. One of its legs was still twitching, but it couldn't clamber to its feet, and its guns were silent. Then, for once, Nave had to search for a target. He had to sweep his block gun halfway across the room before he found an intact drone to fire at. Hey, we're winning, he said. Yes, we're winning, Altia said. Now we just need this creature to know we're on its side, so it doesn't try to smash us with its clawed feet, and we might get a breathing space. Yeah, Nave said as the last drone fell and the space became eerily silent again. Both he and Altia took an involuntary step back away from the monster. It stared at them, though that wasn't the right word, as there were no eyes in its blank face. But somehow, Nave knew it was considering them. We come in peace, Nave said. You were never lost for words when it comes to first contact, are you, Nave? Altia snorted. Nave heard exasperation and love in Altia's words, and seeing them bickering seemed to relax the creature, as though them being distracted from it allowed it to be distracted from them. It looked up, in the direction that would have been the sky, 
if not for the roof of human technology spanning between the top edges of the chasm walls above them. While the monster was distracted, Nave stared at the creature's flesh. It's pretty beat up, he said, which was an understatement. There were craters in its muscle mass, deep holes with smoke coming out. There were furrows where mass driver rods had dug long trenches. It couldn't be able to feel pain like a human, or it would simply collapse. By rights, it shouldn't still have been standing there at all. It had had enough blaster and mass driver fire directed at it to tear apart any organic life form. There had to be a lot more to the beast than met the eye. You're pretty beat up too, Nave, Altia said, looking at the damage to his armor's torso, while he stared at the winged creature. I feel okay, he lied, and she decided to let it go. There wasn't anything they could do about it anyway, not without a medical kit at the very least. The beast was still standing there, staring sightlessly up. It wasn't moving at all. Not even its chest was rising and falling. It was like a statue. Has it fallen asleep again? Nave asked. It's entirely possible, Altia began to answer, but she was interrupted by a communication from Galaxy Dog. Are you doing that? Jay's voice asked in their heads. Doing what? Nave replied, confused. I think I know, Altia whispered, almost to herself. A vortex is forming on the planet's surface, Jay's voice said. Like the one you took the precise strike down into. No, Altia said, voice even. It's not us doing it. It's a creature from before time. An ally, I think. I'm taking a hell of a lot of fire up here, Jay said, ignoring the cryptic turn her words were taking. I don't have any option. I'm going into the vortex. Are you guys at the bottom of that thing? We are, Nave said. Come on down and join us. Mortis watched the scene in the chasm from a secret control room, one of many at his disposal. All his drones had been destroyed, and his subject creature had been released, and worse, it had been awoken. He was gratified to see how badly wounded the male intruder was, and Altia seemed to have a bad wound too, with blood still slowly seeping from the arm of her suit. But his monster was vexing. It was performing for the intruders in a way it never had before. You never stood for me, Mortis spat at the screen. Then his attention was distracted. The drifter ship was descending. Mortis watched it approaching the atmosphere of his gas giant home and gasped. He had been studying drifter technology and culture his whole life. And here it was, come to life. Not the dead remains he was studying, twitching and flickering to the dreams of some remnant of an unimportant servitor species, but alive, undeniably alive. The drifter ship made the human vessels attempting to follow it look like the pathetic, lashed-together contraptions of cave people, which was what they were. I have to have that ship, Mortis growled. A giant vortex was appearing in the atmosphere of the planet, undeniably caused by the winged creature. It was forming more swiftly and stabilizing more perfectly than any he had ever been able to induce the creature to create. It was maddening. He turned his attention back to the chasm floor, where the creature was still contained. He stared at the two human intruders, standing near the creature, trying to work out if they were forcing the creature to do their bidding, or if the creature was acting autonomously. It was impossible to tell, but Mortis had his suspicions. These two seemed intimately familiar with drifter technology and culture, and why wouldn't they be? They were led by Altia, one of the foremost experts on the drifters, famous in scientific circles across the entire Terrazid Star Empire. She had engineered to penetrate within his sanctum. He didn't know how, and now she, her bodyguard, and his captive were obviously intent on leaving. Without his captive beast, the technology he was studying would gradually become lifeless again. It didn't bear thinking about. They had to be stopped. And they hadn't escaped yet. In fact, the drifter ship could still be his. He opened a communications channel to his fleet commander. Admiral Tarvis, he said, as a hologram joined him of the Admiral, looking tired and disheveled after the stress of hours of directing space combat. Mortis, the Admiral said and nodded his head in deference. The drifter ship is approaching the planet. Mortis said, and a transportation vortex is being provided to shepherd it down to the core. 
then we have the ship at last, Tarvis smiled. Only if you disable its engines, Mortis said. The target ship's engines are under heavy fire. And we have done significant damage to them, Tarvis said. Destroy them. Now, Mortis said. Send your best ships after it, and I will use the Vortex to send up more hybrid ships. Mortis dismissed the hologram. Tarvis had his orders. He then watched as three of his hybrid ships chased the drifter ship into the Vortex. They were the most advanced ships ever created by human hand, designed by him himself. And they weren't alone in the chase. Two swift destroyers also followed the drifter ship into the Vortex, powered by engines Mortis had designed, though... He had hobbled them. He knew that the day would come when he would challenge the Emperor, and so he had kept his most advanced designs for the use of his own Admiral, Tarvis alone. And the ships of the two human factions were joined by two buzzer ships. They were just as fast as his hybrid ships, Mortis was forced to admit, with weaponry just as powerful. He gave the two ships an appraising look, impressed by their organic shape, like an insectile version of an arrowhead. They were unmistakably a buzzard design, but his expert eyes could pick out that they too had been influenced by discoveries reverse-engineered from Dirtry technology. Giant space defense cannons were located on the gas giant's surface, and they opened up at the swift destroyers and buzzer arrowheads as they followed the drifter ship. But none were destroyed, and their fanatical pilots certainly weren't deterred. Ablative armor over the drifter ship's engines was being exhausted. Damage was being done to the structure holding the engines in place, and to the drive systems themselves. Mortis watched, open-mouthed, as a stutter appeared in the drifter ship's drive plume. Yes, he yelled. Yes, you rebel scum. How do you like that? The irony that he himself had recently rebelled against the Emperor, and would be seen in his former lord's eyes as just as much rebel scum, was lost on him at that moment. Thank you, Admiral, he yelled. Now, get those other ships out of the vortex. He watched for a second as the spaceships chasing the drifter ship, which had, until seconds before, been a focused hunting pack, suddenly turned into a dogfight. The hybrid ships attacked Swift Destroyer and Buzzer Arrowhead alike, forcing the Buzzers and Imperials to defend themselves. The drifter ship was now coasting ever slower, its drive stuttering more and more, but it was no longer under attack. Perfect, Mortis whispered to himself. He turned his attention to operating massive tractor beams to capture the ship and bring it to a docking bay within his sanctum. Nate was feeling worse and worse, and he would have crumpled to his knees in the water slashing about on the floor of the chasm if the actuators of his power armor weren't keeping him on his feet. But then he felt another sensation, one hard to describe except that it tasted of sanctuary and security. Galaxy Dog is here, he said. Yes, Altia nodded. We'll be able to teleport out of here in a second or two. They both saw it at the same time. There were symbols on the winged monster's chest, and they illuminated, only for a moment or two, before fading again. It has an interface, Nave said. Yes, Altia said, smiling incongruously, as she put together the pieces to answer a little puzzle. That's how Mortis was able to get the technology working using the unconscious alien's interface. They were suddenly joined by a hologram of Jay, then a second later by one of Jinty. We're in trouble, Jay said. We've taken a lot of damage. The engines are losing containment. They'll blow if I keep running them, and they're only at something like 30% of thrust anyway. Galaxy Dog is dead in the water. Powers, Nave cursed. The good news is that the Imperials, the locals, and the buzzers are leaving me alone now. They're too busy dogfighting to chase. Jay's words trailed off as he was distracted by something, his hologram presence looking off to the side at some unseen readout. Tractor lock. I can fight it, but this is starting to look like just a matter of time. Altia felt the alien's curiosity like a force. It was part of their shared mental connection, she realized. She, Nave, and Jay were in each other's heads, only Jinty excluded without an interface, and forced to follow along via the hologram and they were joined by the winged alien. Darkwing, she said. Huh? Genty was the only one who didn't know what she was saying. Both Nave and Jay felt it too now. They felt an alien presence, 
called Darkwing, who was part of their mental connection. They felt it wondering at them, and the fact they each had an interface. I can hear it thinking, Nave said. I can hear Darkwing thinking, but it's in a language I don't understand. Notation script, Altia said. That's what it's referred to as. It's a later period drifter dialect, mostly seen in some notations on the artificial drifter world, mostly in notations to text originally written earlier. Can you speak it? Jay asked her. I've only ever known it as a written language, Altia protested, unsure now if she really had correctly identified the language the creature was using. We only need to say one thing, Nave said. Let's get out of here. By the powers, yes, Jinty growled, her fists clenched, her teeth gritted. Let's get out of here. I'll try, Altia said. She closed her eyes and tried to organize her thoughts as she summoned her knowledge of Darkwing's language. Mortis was busy fighting the drifter ship's shields, and so he didn't notice Altia, her bodyguard, and the captive creature just disappear. They winked out, as if they were made of the same insubstantial stuff as the holograms of Jay and Jinty. One moment, the chasm held a winged monster, two intruders in bronze power armor, and two holograms. Then they were all gone, the holograms, the drifter, and the two intruders. Only the torn remnants of his drone protectors remained some bronze tatters of the intruders' ablative armor and red stains of their blood, spreading through the liquid on the floor of the chasm, mingling with the black blood of the monster. He would notice soon enough. But right now, all his attention was on his prize, the drifter's ship. It was in the bottom third of the vortex now, approaching a docking bay on the surface of the alien structure he had made his sanctum. The planet-sized drifter structure hidden within the gas giant and protected from the terrible pressure at its core by some force he didn't yet pretend to understand. Outside the vortex, any ship could be instantly destroyed by that kind of pressure, no matter how strong its armor, no matter how fancy its shields. Mortis wanted the drifter ship stored away where he could study it before that happened. It was slowing, and its shields were weakening, so even an unskilled tractor beam operator like him was able to attain a lock. Yes, he shouted, and punched the air with his old withered arm, a pathetic gesture of triumph. He relaxed into a chair, exhausted by the events of the day, so different from his usual slow and methodical experimentation. It had been worth it, though, with the drifter ship to study. Living drifter technology at his command, his powers would increase exponentially. It wouldn't be long before the Emperor was crushed, and replaced with a compliant fool like Tarvis, and then the rebellion would be crushed. A few concessions, and that annoyance would just melt away, and then the entire Terrazit Star Empire would be his. First things first, however. He would have to recapture his winged beast and deal with the intruders. He glanced at the monitor showing the chasm, and at last saw that it was empty. He came bolt upright in his chair. Where, he muttered, then an alarm sounded from the tractor beam systems. The tractor lock had been lost. How is that possible, he whispered, as he stared at the controls. The ship was slowing down. The lock should be increasing in strength. But the readouts in front of him told a different story. The drifter ship was accelerating. Its engines were stuttering as much as before, but somehow it was accelerating. How, he muttered. Then he cowered away from the screen as the ship came accelerating towards his position. It was coming right at him, too fast to be docked. A collision seemed inevitable. He screamed. Altia and Nave stumbled onto the bridge to see Jay intently watching the view screens. On the screens, he was watching the wall of bronze architecture in front of them growing. Intellectually, Nave knew that they were actually nose down diving at the surface of the planet's artificial metal core, but it didn't feel that way. With the galaxy dog's gravity sticking him to the deck and the bronze surface of the planet in front of him, it felt like they were flying at top speed at an unimaginably huge metal wall. Okay, Nafe said. I think you can slow down now. Our engines are offline, Jay said. Whoever is flinging us against that wall, it sure isn't me. Darkwing, Altia said, her voice soft. This has to be his doing. Where is he? Jay asked. And what did you do to piss him off? 
Nothing, Nave said. I swear. I'll try comms, Altia said. There's no time, Jay said. And the wall was upon them. Nave instinctively closed his eyes, screwed them up as tight as they would go, and he ducked, which caused a stab of pain from his injured stomach and ribs. But he didn't die. He straightened up, opened his eyes, and saw Altia and Jay on the bridge with him. Ahead of them lay a vortex corridor, just like the one they had been plummeting down seconds before. Except there were differences. The corridor before had been full of dogfighting spaceships, showers of debris, explosions, implosions, mass driver rods, missiles, and blaster bolts. This one was empty, except for them. Those star formations, Jay said, then trailed off. Yes, Nave prompted him. This is going to sound nuts, Jay said. Try me, Nave growled. We've traversed the core of the planet, Altia said. And now we're heading back, out through the atmosphere on the other side. Whoa. Cool, Nave said. Our engines are offline, Jay reminded them. But we are still accelerating. At this rate of acceleration, we'll be able to go to faster than light travel in a few minutes. Are our FTL drives? Nave began to ask. They're fine, Jay told him. It'll be a while before we can use the sublight drives again, but our FTL drives are fine. They soared up, cleared the atmosphere, and carried on accelerating away from the planet. As soon as they emerged from the mouth of the maelstrom, clearing the cloud tops and heading out into space, they were targeted by surface batteries of mass drivers, blasters, and missiles. But it was too little too late. And then, suddenly they were traveling faster than the speed of light, away from the dark heart of the Empire, back to their rebel base. Chapter 25 Hagon took a step back from the view screens in front of him. There were so many of his units flying around the star system that he could watch the drifter ship emerge from almost any direction. It flew clean through the planet, he said. Clean through. Shirian moved to stand at his side, her emotionless voice joining him in evaluating what had happened. Their engines were offline, she said which indicates they were somehow conveyed through the core and then flung out into space, like a giant slingshot. By whatever advanced technology must lie at the heart of that gas giant, Hagon said, and looked round for his command chair before stumbling over to it and sitting. Shirian followed him across the bridge and stood beside him. We have a huge number of fatalities, numbers in the high thousands, she told him. He looked at her, but didn't otherwise respond. I would like to accelerate my program of salvaging them for use as techanoids. I imagine there will be one or two I can use. Hagan nodded. His stomach turned at having even more of Shirian's kind around. But they were loyal. He had to give them that. And after he had seen Tarvis suddenly become a turncoat, and after his own girlfriend had joined the rebellion, there was a lot to be said for loyalty. Disengage. Cease battle, Hagan yelled. There has been enough carnage for today. Shirian nodded and moved to relay his order through the fleet. By the powers, Hagon added in a whisper. There is certainly a lot more carnage to come. Jay went to the levels of the Galaxy Dog that he had given Jinty access to when they first boarded. It wasn't much, just some corridors, the docking bay with Sun Chaser sitting at the center of it, and a large communal lounge with a hexagonal window that looked out into space. It was like a mini version of the observation deck, in the part of the ship that they kept to themselves. She was in the communal area, resting, with one eye on the view through the hexagonal window and one eye on a hologram projector showing a news feed. Not a mention of what is probably the biggest space battle in living memory, Jinty said, dismissively tossing the small hologram projector she was watching to the side. There isn't even anything about Admiral Tarvis turning traitor. Your old boss, Jay observed. Never met the man, Jinty snorted, and I certainly don't owe him anything. Would you like a drink? Jay asked. I'd kill for one, Jinty replied with a wide grin. Do you have a minibar hidden away somewhere? Just a hacked food dispenser, Jay said, but it'll brew up some top quality hooch. Or so Nave tells me. How's he doing? Jinty asked. Fine, Jay said. Turns out Altia's arm wound was worse, but they'll both be fine. They're in sickbay now, 
but both are going to be out in a couple of days. So, you're stuck with me till then, Jinty said. Yes, Jay nodded, and it might be a little longer than that. I'm planning to keep the Galaxy Dog cruising through warp space until the sublight drives are back online. Okay, Jinty said. Good idea. You know, the empire we emerge into when we decelerate from faster than light travel is going to be a lot different to the empire we know. Jay nodded and went to a slot on the wall to fix her a drink. The province I used to call home isn't part of the Terrazit Star Empire anymore, Jinty said, deep shock in her voice. You have no idea how powerful the navy is that Tarvis has at his disposal. The Emperor won't be able to put his down easily. This is going to tear Tarazid apart. And the Rebellion can only benefit from that, Jay said, handing her a drink. Then he lifted his glass. To New Tarazid. New Tarazid, she repeated. The Emperor was in apoplexies of rage. He was at the center of one of the huge ballrooms of a floating palace on a planet designed in terraform to be an excellent hunting ground. Even though they were in a ballroom, nobody was dancing. Everyone was standing in a big circle, with one furious man at the center of it, the Emperor. As the man paced up and down the room, the circle moved with him, nobody wanting to get too close, yet nobody quite daring to just leave either. The Emperor was yelling at his nobles, yelling at the servants, yelling at the guards, Sometimes, he stopped making sense and just started screaming, a primal howl of rage. Bring me Shivya, he said at last. Would you like me to connect you via hologram? A robot, though not one with a particularly high level of artificial intelligence, offered helpfully. No, the Emperor screamed, and he looked round for a weapon. I do not want to speak to her hologram. He spotted an antique hunting spear in a display case, trotted over and broke the case open. He pulled out the spear, with everyone still standing in a circle, all eyes still on him. His chest was heaving, his eyes wild. He went back to the robot servant and stabbed at it with the spear. It was a poor lunge, and the dull point of the old spear glanced from the robot chest panel. I want her here, he screamed, pulling the spear back and lunging again, this time catching the robot through the neck. I want her to explain why. There was a flash, a capacitor suddenly discharged through the metal spear, and the Emperor staggered backwards and fell to the floor. The robot he had stuck with his spear toppled sideways. Neither of them were moving, and smoke was coming from the Emperor's eye sockets and mouth. Do we still contact Shivia? one of the nobles asked. Nave was in a sick bay bed, right next to Altia's. He was still woozy after days of drugs and therapies but he was feeling much more his old self again. He turned his head to look at Altia and smiled. You know, he said, when you first told me you were going to bring down the whole Terrazit Star Empire, I didn't really believe you. She looked at him and grinned, then winced at the pain in her arm. But look, he continued, the whole thing is coming apart at the seams. It's happening. We're going to tear it all down and create new Terrazit. New Terrazid, Altia said, 